So, yeah, thanks, Drew, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so uh, this is going to be a little bit of a change up, I think, because what I want to talk about is how do businesses use data um, and how do businesses use visualizations to make decisions about what they're going to do as a business. So I've, I get the impression this is quite an academic crowd. Um, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll apologize for talking about business. I'm a reformed academic, so hopefully that makes me feel a little bit, you know, less dangerous, but let's see how it goes. Um, so <laughs> what I want to talk about in this talk is, is much more on the data side, but we will touch on the kind of visualizations people use, but also to give you a bit of a view about how do businesses collect data, and particularly how do tech companies, which we love to kind of talk about and worry about, um, you know, what kind of data is being collected by, you know, websites and mobile apps and all that sort of stuff. Um, as a bit of background, what my company does is actually we're, a, we're an analytics provider for mobile apps and games. So what we do is allow people to collect um, very, very detailed information, as you'll see, about what users are doing with their games. And, you know, if you, if you open your, your phone up and you uh, open an app or a game on your phone, there's a very good chance that you're sending my company data right now. We collect, you know, billions of events a day from all over the place. And, of course, um, this leads people to be very paranoid about what's happening with this data and, um, and where is it going and what's it done with it. Uh, and hopefully some of this talk will, will lay your fears <laughs> because actually the general rule companies are very poor at using data and creating good visualizations to understand what that data means for them. Um, but let's just crack on then. So what do companies collect? So this, you know, this is where it gets a little bit worrying, but this is the world we live in. So, you know, basically you know, any type of, of business that has, you know, consumers, whether it's a, you know, a bank or whether it's a, a shopping, uh, you know, supermarket or whether it's a game, whether it's a mobile app, basically everything you do will be tracked. So if you go online, uh, you know, go onto Amazon and you look at an item, that will be tracked. If you use your card at an ATM, that will be tracked. If you play a game on your phone, which is what we do, that will be tracked. And you know, if you use a loyalty card scheme, uh, a loyalty scheme card like you know a club card or your Sainsbury's cards, of course that information gets tracked. And the level of detail in this data is extremely high. So it's not just you know you used your card at ATM. It's how much did you withdraw, what time of day it was. If you're looking at items, of course, what type of item that is at some sort of high level of category, where you know what your location is, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and really, you know, this kind of tracking's been been made possible because we're all connected all the time. And actually storing loads of data and processing it is really cheap. Computers are you know, very, very cheap to spin up a couple of servers in Amazon these days. Um, set up all this tracking. It doesn't cost you very much to store the data. It doesn't cost you very much to process it, right? Um, and in fact, you know, it's that which has led to this rise of tracking, not necessarily that there's an amazing business case for it or these businesses really know how to use this data. It's that actually it's so cheap for them to do it, they might as well do it anyway. Um, and, you know, and we're part of that as well. We offer you know, a relatively cheap service for people to do this kind of stuff. To give you an idea of the kind of stuff that we would track, so this is for a typical game, right? This is just a sample of what like, you know, our event list might look like for a game. And so we track things in game like you know, when you watch ads, um, what you do with those ads, how you interact with them, uh, achievements you might make when you create characters, when you up, uh, um, upgrade those characters, you know, how you unlock features and so on. This is just the start of an alphabetical list, which may, you know, a typical game might have 20 events that we track where, you know, it's down to the level of individually clicking on stuff, right? And so, you know, a typical game might have, uh, you know, 100 events that it tracks when you're in a session on the game. And so that translates into, you know, tens of millions of events a day for a typical game. And for us, we process about a billion events a day. So, you know, the scale of the data that is coming in is, is just enormous, right? Um, and you would think, you know, with all this data, then you must be amazing things that you can do with it. But what tends to be the case is that actually is really only used for these three things. So um, the first is the obvious one. So basically what people do is they take all these events, these millions and millions and millions of events, they boil them into a core set of maybe like four or five numbers, which they use to tell how, how their business is going, right? These would be things like, how much money did I make today? How many users did I have today? you know, um, how many of those users played yesterday, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll show you examples in a sec. Um, a slightly cleverer thing they do is to do A-B testing. So if you say mm, we want to change something, let's have two options. Let's see which one's most popular. Um, and then we'll stick to that one. Um, and then, of course, there is some level of machine learning, but I'll talk about that when I get to it, that it's, it's very, uh, it's used for very simple purposes. Um, so this is uh, hopefully 
this is somewhere between the, the bad and the ugly of visualizations. <laughs> um, although this is actually what our product looks like, so I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> but this is the kind of KPI tracking that people do, right? So they'll have a chart which tells them how many users they have every day. They'll have a chart which tells them this retention is like how many people are coming back every day. Um, you know, these kind of very, very high level things. They might even have a funnel which tells them some fun stuff like, okay, how far into my game are people getting before they quit, right? So, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a dashboard. Pretty much this is how businesses use data. They take all these, this wonderful data, they hire a whole bunch of data scientists and BI analysts to sit there and churn it through and then they make this and they put this on TV screen and they go, cool, we've got data, <laughs> tick. Let's go to, you know, let's go have lunch. Um, right, so this is not a great dashboard. Um, this might be a better one, and of course my, my um, friends here at Number, Learn, uh, number Telling, sorry, not Number Learning, uh, would, would, would argue this is better because it's in Tableau. But here you've got some kind of ability to filter things and you can interact with it and all this sort of stuff, right? But, you know, the thing that strikes me about these kind of visualizations, since we're talking about visualizations today a lot, is that there's lots of numbers here um, and there's lots of information, but it doesn't really tell you anything. So if I look at this and I go, cool, there's, there's a bunch of straight lines or maybe there's like a line that goes down and up again, there's nothing here that really says why that is. Um, so as a business, and you know, here maybe I can interact with it a little bit more and you know, obviously if you build very good visualizations in this vein where you can, they are interactive, you can get a bit deeper, but it is quite difficult with high level numbers like this, regardless of how you visualize them. If you just have you know, numbers which are like, what is my sales per, X or what, how much did I make here and that kind of stuff. It's very hard to understand why those numbers go up or down. Um, and so, you know, this is great. And when you, when you make these kind of things, like I say, you have, I've been to many, many companies and they love to have, you know, 40 inch LCD screens all over their walls with these things blaring out at the, you know, everyone to, to emphasize how important data is. But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help you, it gives you confidence, but if something goes wrong, if, you know, if all of a sudden, instead of this number going up, it starts going down, all that's gonna happen is people are gonna panic. <laughs> so it doesn't tell you what to do, it just tells you to pa when to panic or not, uh, which it doesn't feel like a good way to use data. Um, the other way people use data is to do testing, and this seems like a better use of data, and it is. So um, basically you build multiple versions of something, so let's say I have a game, I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a candy crush game, but I don't know if people like blue candies or green candies. So I make both versions of it and I release them and I find out, okay, cool. Um, you know, the one with blue candies gets people to spend 47% of the time, whereas the one with green ones, they only spend 20% of the time. So I definitely should just use the, the green one or the blue one, or whichever one I said. Um, typically you just choose one number to make a decision on, but of course you could do something more complicated. So this is meant to be if I, if I was sending people emails, let's say I email you an offer to buy some item on Amazon and I email you a different offer to buy some other thing on Amazon, um, you know, whether you open that email or you know, whether you came back later and whether you actually made a purchase, that kind of stuff. You can build a funnel which would show you how successful that is in a, in a more granular way, but still you're only looking at one thing here. You're, only, you're sort of saying, all right, I built two versions of thing, this thing and then I've got one number which I decided is my magic number. Um, and then I make a decision on it. And this is, this is good practice, but it's still very uh, sort of isolated usage of data. The final thing people do is machine learning. This kind of, you know, when you talk about big data and machine learning, people try to build tinfoil hats. Um, but, you know, it's not actually that bad because if you look at how people use machine learning, 90% um, of the usage of machine learning um, fits into two scenarios, right? The first of them is what's the likelihood that this user will leave? So if you've been playing Candy Crush for the last six months, there's a process in the background that every day works out the probability that you won't play Candy Crush anymore. And if you drop below some level, it will send you a message to say, please play more Candy Crush. Um, and similarly, you know, if, you, if you show some tendency to spend, and this is where things like um, you know, Amazon, if you have bought five items on Amazon, they'll have some code in the background which says, mm, they haven't bought anything in 10 days, maybe we need to send them an email to give them an offer to buy a you know, new pair of shoes or something like that, right? So that's, that's probably the number one usage of machine learning. Um, the other way is the classic, you know, what you see on your front page when you go to Amazon or YouTube or whatever. If you've spent all your money on Amazon buying, um, you know, 
shoes, then your entire front page will be filled with shoes. I know for me, the machine learning works very well because my kids love watching um, Minecraft videos on YouTube. So whenever I go to YouTube, all I can see is Minecraft videos. Um, so I think it's starting to work. Actually, I'm starting to like Minecraft videos more. So it's, it's a cycle. Um, but you know, so but the output of this is very, you know, it's very tame, right? Like you think there's all this machinery in the background spinning away to try to learn stuff about you, but all it really is going to do is it's going to send you a message to say, would you please like to do something? And then if you ignore that, it fails, right? The other part of this is that all of this stuff tends to sit in a black box. So it's just sitting there in a black box that someone built. There's a big server somewhere which just spin these models away. There's probably some number that is the performance metric for the machine learning. So it says, you know, oh, we wrote this model to try to prevent churn. Last week, our retention was, you know, 30%. And now it's 32%. So it works. Great. Maybe we could make it 33%. But it does, you don't learn anything about your customers doing it this way. You don't learn anything about the people that are actually sending you all this data. And so from, from my mind, data only really comes into play at kind of either end or, or you know, at kind of extremes of, of what you're doing as a business, right? You, go, you look at the, your big dashboard and you say, is there something going wrong? Do we need to actually do something? And then, of course, if something is going wrong, then everyone, you know, all the kind of management and product managers and CEOs and stuff, they go off and have a big meeting, and all the BI analysts sit there and wait, you know, sort of wondering whether they're going to have a lot of work to do tomorrow, which they almost certainly will. Um, but you know, there's no, there's nothing that from the data side that gets used in the decision making process. It's just is something wrong or not. Um, and then the other way, of course, is well, talking about A/B testing. So you've you've built X versions of something, which one is the best one? But again, you didn't use the data to decide which one was the best one. You just, you're, you know, your creative people and um, management types decide what the best things are. And then, of course, you test one against the other. But they could both be terrible. Um, and you're not using the data to tell you whether you're only presenting terrible options. And so, you know, what I like to ask is, you know, can, is there a way that we can use data to, to drive better design, right? Why can't we, you know, collecting all this data on all of these users? Is there no way that we can use this to understand them better, to, to actually understand our market better, understand what people want, um, build better products, um, give, people, you know, give people more of what they want? What do they like? What do they hate? What can we glean from the data? Um, and there must be considering how much of it we're tracking. So you know, the question for me, and I think as part of Dell CNA, we're, we're really trying to push this, is you know, how can this data be, be used more effectively? Right? What more can we do? Um, to use this data, and I think you know this does start to come into the into the visualization and the way that you use data. Because for my mind, and like I said, I I am a reformed academic, so I used to be an astrophysicist, and there one of the biggest problems we always had is you know how do I get to a simple number, right? Like you can make all the lovely visualizations that you like, but if you're still presenting very complicated concepts in a series of you know, loads and loads and loads and loads of numbers, it's very easy to get buried by that and not be able to see the kind of, you know, the, uh, the forest for the trees, right? And so actually deciding what the right numbers to measure can, can really unlock a lot of this data. And so for us, a lot of what we want to do is, is much more user-centric analysis. So all the stuff I was showing you before, it's like, here's my revenue and here's my, my actives and here's my this and that. But it doesn't really tell you anything about the users. Um, and so, you know, the kind of questions that, that I like to ask, you know, these are the, these kind of an, the traditional analysis is about, you know, how many times was something purchased? Like, what's the popularity of an item, or what's the popularity of a of a mission, or something like that? How many players complete a certain mission, or how many times is a web page viewed? It's all about measuring bar charts of popularity, but really that doesn't look at the outcome for the user. So, you know, if if uh, the my most popular web page is visited, you know, millions and millions of times, but not a single person ever goes on to make a purchase, actually, that's not a very good website. Um, and similarly, if I have you know, loads and loads of people interacting with a certain part of my game, if that results in a negative outcome for those people, that's, a, that's something which we need to worry about. That's a design which is broken. And so you know, I much prefer to ask questions like, what fraction of customers that you know, purchase a particular item have a good outcome from that and go on to purchase again? What kind of fraction of players that complete a certain mission then leave the game? And that, that allows you to split out popularity and also the, the impact of what users are interacting with. And so this is a very kind of toy example of 
um, you know, you have a game, you come into the game, you do the tutorial, and at the end of the tutorial, you've got three options, right? So you can either go directly to the, sec the second mission, you can go and do a kind of side mission or, you know, a kind of side thing, or you can upgrade. And then if you look at, you know, in, in, in my kind of view of this, rather than looking at the popularity of those, of those um, outcomes, look at actually how, what was the outcome for the user, right? You know, and we can present it this way. So day one retention in our speak means how many people came back to play the next day. Um, and here, you know, in this kind of chart, I think you can start to see immediately, oh, okay, well, we only had 25% of people who completed mission two straight away come back. We had 31% of people who upgraded their character come back. We had 18% of people who did the side mission come back. So really, actually, this is the best thing for people to do. This is, drives the best outcomes, right? So you know, now we can start to make decided decisions about, OK, well, maybe we should signpost people towards this. Maybe we should you know, funnel them in that direction, not let them go over here, because people come over here have bad outcomes. Now, this is a little bit naive, but it's meant to be a toy example, right? But you know, I don't propose this to be a great uh, visualization, but I think you know, when, you ask, when you present the right question or you ask well, what the right number, you can immediately start to infer something from that. Um, of course, you can take this a step further. Um, I personally don't like these kind of charts, but some people do. So these are these kind of like user flow charts where um, you take the example I just had, but you start to sp split it out into all the possible things people could do. So in this one, uh, this is about, um, what is this about? I can't remember. <laughs> I, uh, I stole this from somewhere and now I can't remember what it's about. But anyway, at the top it says start session, which I think everyone can you know, interpret. And then it says something about gas and car and all sorts of stuff. Maybe this is a video, this is a game about cars, I can't remember. But anyway, the point being is that um, it shows you the different paths people go down. And it's not just showing you the popularities of each path, but then who goes on to do what next, right? And there's many different ways you can do these. I believe these are called Sankey diagrams, or this maybe not this one, but there's similar. Yeah. Um, and these can be a bit unwieldy, but they're quite powerful if you can get them to be reasonably constrained, right? And now we're trying to mix a bit of the, you know, okay, not just let's assess how popular something is, but also what's the outcome for our users if you go in a particular direction. Um, one of the problems with this kind of stuff, though, is that, uh, what's on the slide, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, so the point I'm trying to get at for real stuff is that, you know, this kind of, these kind of diagrams and this kind of analysis allows you to actually make design decisions, like what is working and what isn't working, right? You know, um, let's make more of the things that work and less of the things that don't work. Because um, you want actually what you want, and the right, the right question to ask from your data is, are my users getting good outcomes? Um, and are they then sticking with me? So, yeah, cool. All right, so um, the problem with this kind of stuff is a little bit naive, right? Because you're assuming basically everyone's the same. So basically what you're saying in here, which is wrong, is that, okay, you know, everyone who did this was great, and everyone who did this was not great, but if I take all these people and put them in here, is that actually going to... Is this number going to stay, or is it going to go down, right? So, so this is limited in some ways, and so actually, you need to start with the understanding that actually not all your customers are the same; they are different, right? And so, actually, what you want to do is is from the data, let the data tell you what kind of archetypes, what kind of personalities there are, in you know that are using your product, and how can I then build a product that is catered to those people, right? And it may well be that you've built, you know, you think you've built an amazing product which you love, but you're not a very good representation of the human race. I know that I'm not a good representation of the human race. So when I build things that I like, people tend to hate them. So <laughs> I think, and there's a classic problem there that, you know, you, when you, you have something that you, you, you've built for out of, you know, your own creative, you know, ideas and what you think you, is amazing for, for you, but of course, not everyone is you. And so trying to understand your, your customers better through data is a really powerful uh, tool to build a better product and, and, and broaden the base of whatever you're trying to do, whether it's you know, get people onto your website or um, play your game or, or anything. So the way we do this, um, and this, I'm going to take you through a kind of worked example of how we do this, because we do a lot of this uh, uh, kind of work at Dell TNA. So you know, for a game, what we might do is identify some key behaviors that we see in the data, things like you know, how engaged players are, how competent they are, potentially how aggressive they are, if that makes sense. Do they have very risky behaviors? Um, do they have very <coughs> um, conservative behaviors? How social they are? Um, and then you can use clustering algorithms to try to segment the players, but, but this makes it a bit hard to visualize. So um, you know, what we tend to do is do these kind of 2D visualizations, which 
Um, we could argue about it if you want to. But the point here is that you know, uh, we quite often would have sort of eight to 10 metrics that we would use per player. And then we try to collapse it down into 2D using the variety of techniques you can do this. But one of the, the ones that I particularly like is this um, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Um, but anyway, so here's my, my kind of toy example. And here's my, my clusters, my four clusters of players. Um, I don't know what they are yet because I've just run this through my, my code to tell me whether my data is clustered at all. Um, and it seems like, yes, you know, my behaviors, I've, if I use my toy behaviors of engagement and competence and aggression and social, yes, my data is clustered. There are kind of four archetypes of, of players in my game. Um, and then what I quite like to do is then start to layer on the metrics themselves to understand what these clusters mean. Because it's not, you know, obviously they're not all completely distinct. They just have trends in different ways. And so, um, you know, doing this kind of thing, we can build our profile of players. So let's say that the number of missions people play per session or per day is some measure of how engaged they are. So, you know, down here, I've got a little island of people that are playing, you know, more than 20 missions a day. These are the really engaged guys. So, you know, already I know that my more engaged players are down here, but I've got some of islands of, of people who are not so engaged up here. So that's good. So let's have a look at the other metrics then. So then let's say I have, you know, my win rate that's measuring how competent my players are. So I know that there's very competent players over here and maybe there's some very competent players up here. Interestingly, the guys that are engaged are not so competent, which you know, maybe because they're, they're chugging away at the game, you know, they really love it, but they can't figure it out, you know, who knows. Um, up in the top corner, I've got people who are not so good. So I can see already that they're clustering together. Um, I can take social, so how, many, how social are people? Are they chatting with their friends in game? And again, this gives a different layout. And you can see, obviously, the clustering algorithm itself is trying to push these people apart because they're different, right? They're different in these metrics. But then starting to visualize in this way, you can start to build a picture of who's, who's living where. And that starts to give us an idea of what kind of archetypes we have in our game. And you can imagine doing this kind of process for, for anything, right? You, know, you could imagine in websites, you'll have people that uh, you know, visit website very often but never spend. You'll have people who are very impulsive, you know, perhaps like me, who just like when they want to buy something, they just click buy now and then regret it for the next six months. Um, you know, th there's lots of different behaviors that you can imagine in, in any of these kind of applications. Um, and so, you know, I think, and you know, we can argue whether this is a good or a bad visualization, but I think um, the point uh, I'm trying to get to in this talk is that you can use this data if, if you ask the right questions. Um, and you try to put the, the user in the center, um, you can start to build a really powerful idea about what the data is telling you about what they like, what they don't like, and then build better products from that. And you know, this, is a, this is a relatively advanced way of doing that, but you don't have to do anything anywhere near as advanced as this. Um, so that was quick, but that's OK. Um, so my kind of conclusions are that, you know, Modern companies track a lot of data, like just enormous amounts of data. Um, it's, it's shocking how much of it they track. And it, it is mainly because it's very, very cheap to do so. It's not because they, they've worked, got it all worked out. It's because they can do it very cheaply. And the, the number of times I've heard, oh, you know, let's just do it and we'll figure it out. You know, let's track all these things and we'll figure out some way to monetize it later. It's the most commonly used phrase in any BI team uh, in, an, in a tech company is, you know, we can, we'll monetize the data later. Let's just track it to make sure it's there. Um, but you know, and that's why it's only really used in a basic way, but with the right perspective, any, and even there's a lot of scope here for visualizations, I think, and you know, one thing I'd say to this audience is that um, there's been a big change in the way that businesses treat data. So traditionally, you know, there wasn't room so much, apart, outside of the finance world, there wasn't so much a room for uh, very powerful statistics and very powerful statistical mathematical programming in businesses, they didn't need it. They just needed traditional analysts with Excel spreadsheets and that was doing them fine. Now, of course, if you, know, if you can pretend that you're a data scientist, you can add a zero to your pay packet. So you know, that's the first phase of that. But you know, now we've got all this data there and no real ability to visualize it or use it in a way that is effective and allows better communication through companies. And that's really where businesses are right now. They've got a lot of data. They've got a very simple view of it. They're crying out for more intelligent ways to interact with it. And that's, I mean, I guess that's where the number telling guys are coming from as well. But you know, there's a huge opportunity there um, to, to unlock this data to make better decisions in companies. And hopefully, you know, our, my company is doing part of that. But you know, if any of you uh, are non-academic or, ch or choose to not be academic in the near future, I think there's a huge opportunity for, for better data visualization in this, uh, in this sector. And I'll leave it there.
just, just curious from ethical perspective, ethical poor perspective, um, using this personal data uh, to avoid any to identify an individual, do you have an ethical tool? Um, we, so we can't identify individuals. Uh, well, okay, I'll, 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 put, I'll say the blanket statement and then I can give you the caveat to that. So as is a general rule and as our kind of company uh, you know, standpoint, we don't track any personally identifiable data, right? The dots are shrinked, graphically. Yeah, but that doesn't, I don't have your email address, I don't have your home address, I don't have your phone number, I don't know anything about you. I just know that you like doing this or this, right? But I can't, you know, there's nothing I can do with you apart from interact with you inside a game. So, you know, you can change the experience for an individual player, but you can't, you know, hunt them down. Now, that's not always true. <laughs> yeah, because especially you're tracking the cards. Yeah, and so, but then, you know, obviously we're subject to regulation in different sectors. Gambling is an interesting one, um, but I'll leave it. So, so you're not getting any ethical approval? No. Sorry? You're not working on any ethical approval? So it's up, we're, put it a different way, we're a third party service, um, so it's up to our clients to get the approval to use products like us. And to be honest with you, they're already tracking this data and just sending it to us anyway. So, you know, we provide a service, we're not the ones that, you know, that need to get approval. In different sectors, it means different things. For, for people in gambling, there's some regulation, although it could be a lot tighter. Um, in traditional apps in the app store, there's almost no regulation. Apart from when it comes to children, of course. You can't do, there's very specific rules about uh, tracking people who are under the age of 13. But then the app stores won't let, well, if you're under the age of 13, you're not meant to have an iTunes account or something like that, right? Doesn't mean, yeah, exactly. But that's the, okay. sorry. Thank you. Blockchains. No, no. So we no people explicitly send us data. We don't collect any. We don't sniff out any data which which um, is not being deliberately sent to us. Uh, th there are yeah, there are kind of tangential services which will do things like that, um, but they, that we don't do that. Um, if that makes sense. There's, there's a lot, there's a big industry, it's very, very complicated, but um, online advertising <laughs> would love to know more about you <laughs> at any given point in time. And so they try to do a lot of that kind of stuff to, when you're in, it's at a point where it might want to show you an ad, there's lots of services which will try to collate as much information as it possibly could about you to make a better decision. But we don't do that kind of stuff. Do, do you, sorry. Sorry. No, do you have um, any experience of doing this sort of analysis for health apps and medical research apps of the, the sort that um, are currently being developed, particularly with Apple's new uh, research kit? Um, no, <laughs> is the short answer. Although I do get asked that question a lot. I think it's whenever I give talks in Edinburgh Uni, there's always a kind of core <laughs> group of... Uh, people interested in it. But yes, I mean, uh, the, but the method applies equally, right? And particularly in that case, it's about user experience, right? Um, and it's about a lot of, you know, I'll put it a slightly different way, which is hopefully in, so I've tried to get a little bit across. What, what we try to do a lot in the analytics we're doing is to understand the user experience. So put yourself in the mindset of the user. What confuses users? What, you know, what do they not understand about how they're using your app? And one thing I would say, which is slightly controversial, is that I think this kind of process is infinitely more powerful than doing any kind of focus testing. Because if you, you, know, you pay a huge amount of money to focus test your app with you know, 20 people, or 100 people, or whatever, you know, fine, you, you can put them in a room and you can ask them a lot of questions, but you're gonna, always going to have problems that it's quite biased and it's not a kind of natural environment and that kind of stuff, right? On the App Store, you can release an app tomorrow. You could have tens of thousands of users almost instantly. And as long as you set the data up correctly, you should be able to gather the same insights. Um, and it'll be in a natural environment, right? It's not, you know, they're gonna use their crummy phones that they've you know, bought secondhand. They're gonna, they're gonna have terrible internet connections, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, you, and we do a lot of this for our clients, is that kind of focus, that, what you would do in a focus testing, right? What elements are confusing? What elements don't people understand? What do people like? What do people hate? trying to infer that from the data rather than just, oh, here's how, many, how much money I made, that kind of stuff, so yeah. Hey, can I just help you out there as well? Sorry, as soon as you download an app and you press accept, it doesn't matter if you're a game developer, 
you've already given your information, you've already given your permission away. So wherever companies track you, tech companies track you, you've already given that permission, yeah. pretty much. As soon as you say identity, except photos, media, view history, it's yeah. acceptable. Yeah. The, the only positive thing is that the company's not very good at doing, <laughs> doing anything with it, so not that I've seen anyway. Okay, so uh, that brings us to the end of the second session, but thank you again to Isaac. <laughs>